Hello everyone, well, welcome to another Grain and Grape uh, live brewing demonstration. Grain and Grape is a homebrew shop um, and we're, our aim is to help you uh, all out there brew better beer. We do that by making videos and uh, the occasional live stream like this one. So if that sounds at all useful to you, maybe consider subscribing. Um, so uh, for those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Joel, this is Jeff. Uh, and today uh, we're going back to basics. Jeff is going to be showing us uh, how to brew a beer the easy way. Yes, um, brewing is fundamentally a, a, such an easy process, it almost does it by itself. So what I'm trying to do today is illustrate that by um, following what I call um, an easy brew. So eight steps from when you decide to brew to when you're actually drinking beer and the company that you go at home. Um, and so without any sort of science or accuracy or measurement or any of that sort of palaver, hopefully just with a, a bit of grain, some water, some hops and a great deal of um, carry on, we'll be making some beer. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. So um, a little bit of business for anyone watching. Um, you'll know there's the chat function to the side of the screen there. Feel free to ask any questions as we uh, proceed along. May not get to all of your questions, that all just depends go but uh, we'll do our best um, but if anyone else out there uh, wants to chime in if you see a question that you know the answer to uh, by all means right um, help out in the chat too so we like to see uh, you know, a bit of a lively discussion there so me making a full night <laughs> so uh, yeah that's all part of the fun um, I think so without any further ado I will I'll get out the way and uh, I'll uh, let Jeff take over from here cheers what I want to do today is make um, a Vienna IPA. It's a 100% um, Vienna malt IPA. Um, in a sense, that's not very important, except that Vienna malt um, is something which, when used by itself, can give you a really nice flavour some beer. Adding some hops to it is, um, does the hoppy thing. I've tried to use the very simplest equipment that I can get my hands on. I've got a $19 big W pot that I wanged a, um, a ball valve into. I've got a cheap induction hob. Um, I've got a brew in a bag bag uh, um, and several other bits and pieces that you might find around the home, plus what I'll call today a no-till cube. Um, this is adapted from a process which is um, based around a grain grape. Um, 16 and a half litre natural cube, but today, because it's easier, because it's quicker, and because I'm cheap, I'm going to use this um, five litre 
distilled water bottle that I bought from a large green hardware store type place. Um, so I guess that goes to show you can you can cube in anything really, can't you? Um, small batches or uh... that's true. Um, the only real consideration is if the um, the vessel that you're going to use is able to take the heat of a near boiling liquid. Um, if you're to try and put it into a, um, a Coca-Cola bottle, then you'd have a problem. But if you subject those to heat, they get they tend to sort of um, shrink into oblivion. Oh yes, yes. <coughs> Um, but this just happens to be a um, high density polyethylene cube, the same as the things that we sell um, our fresh work kits in. Um, and so I assert that it is a, a decent enough analog. I'm going to be making enough to fill this cube, which um, the manufacturer says is five litres. I've never done it before in this kit, so I don't actually know how much water to add at the start of the process. Um, if you've done it before, it becomes simple, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes. But I've decided that an easy way to, f to work out how much volume ne you need is to work out how much volume you need at the end. And that can be done by opening the tap on your kettle. Pouring some water in until it falls out the tap. I now know then I've got as much water in there as I can, well, sorry, the, the amount of water that's in there, the amount of liquid that's in there is what I won't be able to get out of the kettle without tilting it at the end. But it's going to be there whether I like it or not. I'm making enough, enough beer to fill this, enough wort to fill this cube. So if I fill this cube up with, with water, I've now got the amount of liquid in there that I want to have at the end of the work making process. Because I've got enough to fill this, we know that because we just tipped it in there, and I've got what, we, what um, brewers like to call the dead space at the bottom of the kettle. So having put that much water in there, if I measure that, I know what my target is at the end of the, pro of the boil. My measuring tape says 14 centimetres from the top, I'll make a note of that because I'm dreadfully forgetful. <coughs> so I know that at the end of the at the end of the process, when I want to decant this into my no chill cube, I've got to be I've got to have the amount of liquid that equates to 14 centimetres from the top of the kettle. I know because I read it in a book somewhere that because I'm boiling it, that I'm going to be losing some volume. I know that, um, that the grain that I put in there is going to act a bit like a sponge, and so I need to put a bit more in there to accommodate that. And I propose that we guess that. Um, in my case, you might argue that it's an uneducated guess. I'm using one and a half kilos of grain. If I estimate one and a half litres of water will be consumed by the grain, and if I say maybe I'll boil off half a litre, for, then if I throw another two litres of water in there, then I'm probably good to go. I'm just going to go. I've got some water in here. I'll get a bit more. Ultimately, it doesn't matter too much because the process relies on a certain amount of, or a certain lack of precision. I'm not looking to be precise or scientific or accurate. I'm just looking to understand the process, um, just to get through the whole, I was going to say to get through it, that makes it sound as though I don't like it. Um, <laughs> the idea is to understand the process, get into muscle memory before you actually take on the, the challenge of, of the technical stuff. That's some good advice, I think, for anyone starting out there, just not to be too concerned about being precise and just 
um, you know, uh, it's more about the process, like I say, getting your head around that and... I think that it's possible for you to make um, good beer without knowing any science, but it's not possible to make good beer without knowing the process. Um, and so, you can, if you start off, understand the process, you can then learn as much science or as much of the, the science behind it as you feel that you want to, um, and forget the rest of it. I've got a, a thermometer that I spent way too much money on, on the internet. I'm going to try and heat this water to 68 degrees Celsius. Um, what I'm essentially going to do is, um, when it's at, at temperature, I'm going to, um, inside a bag, I'm going to steep this grain in the warm water for a, an hour or so with the, um, the idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be coercing the grain to convert starches into sugars. Um, this isn't at the same temperature as the water. It's going to be a bit cooler. And so by heating this up a bit higher than the grain temperature, I'm going to save myself a little bit of time. Whilst that's happening, it's still heating up, I'm going to add a small amount of calcium chloride to the, to the water. I'm used to measuring it with um, drug dealer scales, but today I'm just going to use a spoon. And I think a generous teaspoon, which is a not very generous tablespoon, in it goes. There's a number of things that that does, but the most important thing, two most important things, maybe three, is that um, the enzymes in the, in the grain that are going to convert starches into sugar um, do so more um, effectively when there's some calcium in the water. And with calcium chloride, there is, when I put it in there. And chloride um, in helps humans or enhances our ability to taste malt. Um, we're making a quite hoppy beer today, but um, I want some of the malt flavours to come through. Chloride will help that. I'm only making a five litre batch today, um, which is notionally a seven litre batch because I took the liberty of measuring how much dead space was in my kettle earlier on today. So I'm, I'm making a seven litre batch. Normally I would do this with a grain and great fresh work kit, which is um, 16 and a half. That means I'd be looking to make about 20 litres. So I've sort of divided it by three to get about one and a half kilos of grain that I'm going to be mashing with. I'm almost there. I've got what's known as a brew in a bag bag, which comes in a brew in a bag bag bag. bag? <laughs> um, it's a bit bigger than the pot. Um, this is a little bit thick, bit, bit bigger than the pot. Um, ideally, a brew in a bag bag is big enough that you can sort of put the pot inside it. But this one I, didn't, I just pulled out of the shop. I didn't have to do anything to it. I'm going to tie it onto the handle just so that it doesn't unloose itself. One of my brew buddies says that I have a, a particular knack for making simple things look complicated. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I guess you just want to find a way to prevent the bag from uh, falling in back into the pot, don't you? The top of the bag when you put the grains in. That's right. Um, that can be a pain. With my with my bags in the past, I've um, usually got one of those little spring-loaded toggly things that you find on stuff sacks and raincoats and things and put on there and that is enough to hold it, you know, just to hold the, the string around the, the edge of the pot. Um, this string is too big and I forgot to get a toggly thing. <laughs> so those two things in conjunction.
I said we're aiming for 68 degrees because we're mashing it um, at, at 66 degrees. We're almost there. I, I call it close enough. What's a couple of degrees between friends? It's a hundredth of a circle or something, I guess. <laughs> I've just poured the grain in, I'm stirring. Um, people will, when they're talking about brewing, love to talk about grain balls or dough balls, um, which are nice little dumplings that, are, that um, can occur when you're, um, if you put your, your grain into the pot too quickly. Um, it has happened to me in the past. Um, it, it's never happened to me with a 100% Vienna malt fill. I don't know why that is. Um, it's, it happens every time I get malt that um, Matt from the shop mills it for me. He's not listening. <laughs> um, if you get these, if you get little um, dough balls or um, or um, mondu, then you can. You really should try and break them up because it does affect your um, extraction efficiency and it's damned unsightly. So a good stir is a good thing. going to check my temperature again. It's almost come back up to, up to scratch. I'm just using an IKEA induction hob that I think I purchased for $50. That's good for me because it means I can brew outside. But it also illustrates that for this size batch, if you're feeling lucky, you can just do it in the kitchen at home rather mm. than having to find a dedicated space outside. I guess that's a, yeah, an advantage of small batches. You can just brew on the stove at home and if, yeah, a good way to learn if you don't have a lot of gear to start with or a, bit, or a giant pot. That's also, you get to brew more often. True. And I like brewing. Easier to clean. Yeah, lots of advantages. Yes, yeah, so less brew beer to drink at the end of the day, but uh, you just, yeah, got to brew more. At home when I'm brewing, I usually brew on a 70 litre pot. That's a bit cumbersome to clean. This is much easier. I assert that that temperature is about right. So I'm going to turn off the heat. Thusly, give it another stir and let it sit for a while. I'm gonna put the, I'll put a lid on it just to keep a bit of heat in there. So the whole, the whole idea of what we're doing here is to coerce some enzymes that are naturally occurring in the grain to convert starch that's naturally occurring in the grain to some sugar. Um, Subsequently, we will use some yeast to convert that sugar into alcohol, which our livers will convert into joy. <laughs> I'm just going to check my, my eight-step list. I followed it almost as well as you'd expect. Excellent. So basically, uh, in summary, you um heated the water up uh, to a little bit above the temperature that you were uh, intending to mash at because adding the grains will bring the temperature down a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you added the grains and now the temperature's back up at what was about 66, 66 67, degrees, yes. something um, like that. There's a, um, Ben from the shop here likes to mash at the temperature 66.6 .6 degrees. <laughs> Very um, precise. I don't know why he likes that temperature. Perhaps, perhaps you should just come into the shop and ask him. Um, but triple six is probably a, a nice number. 66 is a good number to rem remember. Um, without getting too sciencey, there's a couple of different um, species of enzymes that live in, live in malt and they operate at different temperatures. And as a brewer, um, 
one of our tasks is to find the right temperature to measure in between there, de depending upon what we're trying to achieve. Um, and that is a balance between fermentable and unfermentable sugars. Um, the fermentable sugars give us booze, the unfermentable sugars give us mouthfeel. 66 degrees is a good number. Now, um, you can try, you can spend a lot of your time and effort trying to keep it at exactly that temperature all the way through. With this sort of kit, it's going to be quite difficult, um, if not impossible. Um, so you can either mellow and just try and keep, do, do the best you can, uh, which means sort of checking it occasionally, or you can go out and spend a great deal of money on a complicated, automated, computerised system that will do it for you. Um, my view is something like this, which all up costs 100 bucks or less, is a good way to start, so that if the, if the habit sticks, then you know that, that you, you know how to brew, you know what you're doing, you can move on to something else. You've got a better understanding of what it is that you might want. Um, and if it doesn't stick, then you've got yourself a nice little induction hob, or you've still got the kitchen stove, and you've spent 20 bucks on a pot. You haven't wasted too much on gear. Yeah, yeah. you're not going to use. Um, and uh, I guess the temperature will drop a little bit over the course of an hour in that pot, but don't, don't sweat it too much, no, you think? That's basically, because yep. what you can do is you can lift the lid on the pot, stick your thermometer in there and say, gosh, it needs some heat, where will I find it? <laughs> and just if only there heat. was a device you could use. Yes, if, if only there was a way. <laughs> The only thing I'd say is that whenever you're re um, adding heat to the mash, whenever you're taking the temperature, it's a good idea to stir it. Um, one of the things that happens when you let um, liquid um, sit is that the stuff at the top tends to get hotter than the stuff at the bottom. Um, you want, ideally you want it to be the same temperature all the way through, you're not going to achieve that. But you do want to know what the temperature is, so give it a good stir. Besides which, I think that Stirred mashes are happy mashes. Oh yeah? So just keep an eye on it over the course of an hour and, and uh, give it a, a, a gentle uh, nudge in the temperature department if it needs it. Uh, but no need, mm. no need to worry too much. No. Especially when starting out. So, what are, actually we're getting some comments, I might need to do some sound readjustments. I don't know if it's easy for everyone out there to hear us. Uh, I will just cut to a break quickly and we'll do some, some microphone adjustments and, and be right back. Hopefully that'll, that'll make things a little clearer. Be right back. And we're back. So hopefully, hopefully that's better. Uh, let us know if you have any troubles hearing us. Um, but um, hopefully that's a slight improvement. We've just tweaked things a bit. So can as I you say, were, Jeff. Can I say something now? <laughs> you, can, you can speak. <laughs> you may speak. Cool. So 
there's a number of things that we can do whilst this is mashing. Um, I choose, on this occasion, to wash out my no-chill cube. Um, if you've hung around brewers for any period of time, you'll have heard at least one of them say that brewing is cleaning. Um, and I believe that one of the things that characterises a good brewer from a not so good brewer is their attention to detail when it comes to cleaning. Um, I want to clean this because I'm going to put the wort into it um, and I'm going to follow the time honoured process that we use around here which is to clean, rinse and sanitise. We use a cleaner to dislodge any soil um, from the surface of the thing that we want to clean. That could be some yeast from the last, um, the last time I used it or some sugary liquid if I didn't rinse it properly. It could have been something that found its way in there. Um, some mould that was in the water that was used to rinse it last time. Could be anything. But the idea is to use a cleaner to remove that from the surface, to rinse the whole thing away with some clean water, and then to sanitise it using a sanitising solution. Here we like to use in the shop um, sodium bicarbonate, um, which we sell in little one kilo bags. We call it OxyClean, I think. Um, and the idea there is a little bit of, of um, OxyClean, OxyPer. I'll just take some. I'm trying not to spill it everywhere, but of course I'm no good, so. I'm going to put some hot water in there and give it a shake and let it sit for a while. Yeah, it's good stuff. Just a bit of a soak and uh, it really loosens up uh, any, any crud you might have on your gear. Um, we did just have a question come through, Jeff. Uh, this is, a, I guess, a, a mechanical, engineering kind of, in, uh, kind of question. The <laughs> spigot on your pot, Paul is asking, how did you determine where, the, where to place the tap on your pot? Did you do that yourself or was that a pre I did pre do it thing? myself. Um, I've put a lot of holes in a lot of pots and some of them I haven't got right. And I've come to the, um, the conclusion that the traditional advice which is to get it to as close as you can to the bottom of the pot is um, sometimes correct um, but most of the time when you're brewing you're going to end up with a whole bunch of yerk in the bottom of the pot at the end of the process and so if it's off the bottom of the pot a little bit then it's going to help you keep that yerk inside the pot. That's an official brewing term too, yes. yerk? Yerk. Yeah. Um, so I put it near the bottom uh -huh. um, and I applied no science whatsoever. Yep. Um, if you put, as I say, if you put it right at the very bottom, then you'll get most of the stuff that's in the pot out of the pot through the tap. Yep. But that also means that you'll be br bringing out some of the proteins, the leftover husk material, the hot material. It's easier to keep that in the pot if it's up off the bottom a bit. You've also got a little bit of an issue with a lot of pots and they've got a, a rounded corner on the base. Um, can't really show it here very oh, easily, yes. but there there will be from the wall onto the base a curve. It's not just a it's not a um a, a corner. Um, and if you get it too close to that, then you're going to find yourself having difficulty sealing the whole thing as you're trying to clamp everything up against this corner. So a bit off the bottom is a couple good. centimeters. Yep. Um, one of my gifts to brewing is I like to put the tap underneath one of the handles. Um, most people will put it around this side so um, um with the handles like that people like to put it here um, i found that if you put it underneath a handle then it makes it easier to tilt if you do want to squeeze a little bit of extra out of the pot also means that you can store it in a slightly smaller space but that's silly pedantry does that answer i hope i think that's that's a pretty good answer what do you think paul I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good answer, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Don't be scared to use cleaning solution, OxyPur. 
um, OxyClean. Um, having used it in this, I can use it at the end of the, I can put it into a bucket and help use the, the rest of the things and that it keeps cleaning things until it stops cleaning. Um, it's an alkal alkaline cleaner, it'll work for quite a while. And so that's probably all the cleaner that I'm going to need for this whole session. Oh yeah. And as I'm sure you'll, you were alluding to and will show, it's, it's good to clean as you go where you can. Absolutely. I think that um, cleaning, making sure that everything is ready for when you need it, cleaning up immediately after you stop using something, so um, the instant you don't need something, give it a good clean, then that means that at the end of the process you haven't got this gargantuan cleaning task. You've got just one thing to clean and a full beer glass. Mm. One of those things is better than the other. Yes, objectively even. I've dropped a couple of degrees, so I'm going to put a little bit of a little bit of heat in there. If this room were full of people, um, by this stage somebody would have asked me about the water that I'm using. I didn't use the water that came out of that demineralised water container that I'm about to loosen the lid on so it doesn't, doesn't expand. I use water that came out of the tap. Um, here we have a, um, a carbon block filter which helps to remove chlorine which you'll find in most municipal water supplies. At home I pretty much do the same even though I use rainwater. Um, and then for the purposes of my brewing, um, I just treat it as a blank slate. I know that that's not, that is in no way correct, but it's close enough for government work, it's close enough for, for <laughs> brewing, and it avoids having to deal with all sorts of complicated procedures that a lot of um, long time brewers might engage themselves in. Melbourne water is really good for brewing because it hasn't got a lot of stuff that we have to filter out of it. If you're unlucky enough to live in a couple of suburbs of Melbourne, and I think one of them is up in the Dandenong somewhere and the other one's near Tullamarine, um, then they routinely use um, um, chloramines um, as a, to reduce the bacterial load in their water. Um, if you're unlucky enough to have chloramines in your water, then you can't just you can't just filter it out with um, with a filter, and the best thing to do is to grab yourself some um, Campton tablets. So I'm not but sure I feel as though I'm getting a bit complicated. <laughs> yeah, that's um, uh, well, that is something I've heard of chloramines in the water. Uh, that, yeah, some of the uh, viewers may be interested in that. It's a type. Is that's a different type of chlorine? Is it that that's that, that is used that? Um, uh, um, it's chlorine just... bonded to some other chemical. Um, so I don't know enough chemistry to talk about it convincingly. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you, me either. Or I just know that it's not good for brewing. Is is about chlorine as a as a rule is not good for for brewing. Um, and when people say that they put chlorine into the water, then you know it's easy to get out. When they say they put chloramine into it, it's harder to get out. Harder to get out, okay. And we do sell filters here uh, that are particular to removing chloramines. So a standard carbon filter will remove chlorine, and in, in most cases that's all you need. Uh, but as Jeff was saying, the chloramines are a bit more stubborn. So there's a different filter you can buy, or as he said, I'm not sure if uh, people caught it because well, there was a bit of a train yeah. coming through yeah. in the background, but that was a Camden tablet. A Camden tablet. tablet. Right. Um, yes, I'm... Um, I must confess that the filters that claim to be able to remove chloramine have completely rocked my world because I thought that I understood the whole chlorine chloramine thing, meaning that I, I knew that, I thought I knew that chlorine could be removed with a carbon block filter uh -huh. um, and through a process known as adsorption, where it sort of sticks to the surface of the carbon. Okay. It doesn't actually work as a, like a like a filter, filter it's, right. uh, it's just something that, that, that grabs deep. hold of the, okay. the chlorine as it goes past. And I understood, it now, would be, it, it now seems that that's incorrectly, that you couldn't filter out chloramines, that they had to be reacted out. 
but we sell these filters in the shop that yeah, the, um, the label says for removing chloramine. Mm. I suspect that neither of them completely remove it. Mm. It just reduces it to a level. Um, when you read manufacturers' websites about um, chlorine filters, as I have, I haven't read any manufacturers' websites about chloramine, they talk about contact time and that you don't just send the water through at full mains pressure. Um, it needs to go through quite slowly for it to work. Um, again, when it comes to the chloramine, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that in the early days, um, I took a bucket like this and I, um, I drilled a, a big hole in the bottom and put one of those Brita water filter cartridges in it and I would filter my water through that into, into my um, brewing Oh my yeah, brew geez, that would take, that would be a, a slog. Um, it worked kind of all right. Yeah, I um, mean, yeah, in a pinch for sure. Somebody on one of the web websites invented the notion and it got a name, which was fun. It was the Hurundi Vivakshti um, bucket filter <laughs> for those home brewing historical types. <laughs> This is as interesting as it gets when you're brewing at my house. Joel, you've brewed at my house. Does it get any more interesting than this? Oh, you've got llamas. They're pretty interesting. No, I don't. I've got alpacas. Oh, alpacas. Jeez, I always get that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, never, I'll, I'll never get it right, actually. I'll resign to that. Alpacas are beautiful, friendly animals that happily wander around eating stuff out of the, the palm of your hand. Alpacas are, oh, sorry, um, llamas are big brutish animals that listen to um, Nordic death metal. Um, <laughs> oh, and they sound steal, like my kind of people. And steal things from little old ladies <laughs> in the street. I find the, the mash can be a good um, meditative practice. It's just a... Uh, you know, just just calm, and you know, just before the, the calm before the storm, so to speak. Uh, sit sit there gently stirring the mash, and not think about anything else. I don't mind stirring the mash, particularly if you've if you've got something you can fix your gaze on. Um, you know, doing doing it where we are right now. Um, I get to look at a warehouse and Joel, <laughs> and I've noticed that Joel and starts sort of shrinking his seat a little bit if I stare at him for too long. So. I just have to look at the warehouse or yeah. at what I'm doing. And we have a, a comment from one, bro oh, sorry, I got that wrong. One bloke brewing. Um, from one bloke to another? One, from one bloke to another. And basically a... That's me. That's you, good. <laughs> it's not the camera, <laughs> camera crapping itself. Uh, he had a PET bottle explode on him once. Uh, I suppose when um, we're storing some OxyClean solution in water that may have been too hot or just hot water. Um, it it releases oxygen. Is that right? It when is. you when you add it to water, so it's is that something to be careful? which um, I believe is known is what the scientists call an adduct. Um, and so when you add it to water, it becomes um, sodium carbonate of some sort and gives off oxygen. Um, and so you're going to get a gas coming out of the out of solution, which is why that thing was expanding and why your PET bottle blew. Um, yeah. So just just something to be mindful of. And if you're using large quantities of, around it, I, of it, I'm always a bit concerned, even though it's probably being silly, of using it around a gas flame because I know that oxygen and gas flames are mortal enemies. Yes. Um, in the same way that cardboard boxes and gas flames are enemies. Um, I don't, it's probably not enough, but it's always interesting to watch what happens to the gas flame when you're using a bit of, ox, <laughs> bit of um, OxyClean. I thought that one bloke brewing was about to um, talk about um, exploding pea tea bottles with yeast. Oh, well, yeah, gee. Fermenting. I, I, uh, it, take, it takes a bit of pressure for a pea tea bottle to explode, doesn't it? My understanding is they are 
have a higher pressure rating than glass even, but I guess once you've added hot water um, and oxyclean, that's going to increase the chances of it uh, erupting. I think the laws of physics prevail always. Um, and I remember buying um, a little air horn for my push bike so that the cars would hear me when I was, when I was um, riding around and it connected its um, air supply was a peed tea bottle so that you could then just rock up to a, a servo and oh, okay. hook it up to the tyre thingy. <laughs> and there was a notice there saying that there was a notice in the packaging for the air horn that the PET bottle was not a normal one, that it was stronger than normal. Okay. And I could put 80 PSI into that. Um, I suppose it's, there's a number of easy ways to find out how much pressure. Yeah, there there. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of them I'd, would, I'd recommend to friends. <laughs> well, one, one bloke brewing found a way, so. <laughs> yes. Have to work out how many moles of oxygen he created. <coughs> it is exciting. Well, this is a good opportunity for anyone to ask questions if, if uh, about the mash, if any other... I've got a question. You know, you've oh, got a question? No, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just being silly. Yeah. I am going to stir it. I am going to assert that because this is a demo, that our one hour is almost done. Because I think that everyone... Well, it's possible that everyone's seen enough of me standing here staring, staring at a pot. Staring a pot. We can cheat a little bit, yeah. We can. Thank you, Joel. I am going to measure the temperature though, just... In that time, even from when I just turned it off, I've lost a couple of degrees, but I'm not fussed. Mm. So I'm going to make more beeping noises to, to, um, to worry Joel. <laughs> yeah, it's, that is... Uh, oh, sorry to cut you off there. It's, a lesson I had to learn was um, not being fussed. When I started, I was very concerned about the temperature and having it exact and really uh, fretted over this every time it dropped. I, and I, this was brewing four batches in an outdoor gas burner, which was just an ex exercise in futility trying to keep <laughs> it steady. But I thought I could conquer it and I uh, was forever turning the gas on and off and fussing and for the amount of stress it created, uh, looking back, I can, I can say it certainly wasn't worth it. I still make good beer. You still make good beer, even if it's... It's, it's not advice you know. that, you, that you would expect to give professional brewers. No. Because their purpose in life is different. Exactly. Um, but um, when you're brewing for fun and or pleasure, you get to focus on things as much as you want to, which is one of the cool things. Um, so you can complicate it as much as you want. Hmm. Um, you can you can attempt to get absolute perfect temperature control. Um, if that's what makes if that's what makes you joyous, then that's fine. Or you can just Marie Kondo it out of your life and just <laughs> do as best you can. Um, yeah, if it doesn't bring you joy, maybe assess what your process is. But yes, yeah, everyone's different. Some people really, uh, really um, enjoy the precision of it and, and uh, strive for, uh, for that precision. But... Um, of course, it's a really interesting experiment to perform is perhaps to pick a high, a high mash temperature, say 69 degrees or 70 degrees, and make a little batch of beer mashing at, at 70 degrees maybe do another one at 62 degrees and see the difference. Mm. Um, maybe spend one mash um, being super pedantic and trying to keep the temperature as stable as, as possible. And then do another, another brew where you just bring it up to temperature, throw a jumper on it and walk and away and it. browse the internet for an hour and see what the differences are. Because yeah. you might find that for the amount of effort that goes into it, it's just not enough. 
Paul's just asked a, a question. I think it should be fairly easy to answer. Um, uh, he's asking, do you usually allow one litre per kilogram for grain absor absor there? absorption? Um, it depends. I'm going to wait for that thing yeah. to go past. It's just Finn. Hello. Hello. Hello, noisy it's man. Just Finn. <laughs> um, people use different different amounts. Um, I think that to start, it's good to allow one litre, um, and that for your first few brews, meaning maybe you know the first couple of dozen brews, or until you're comfortable that you've nailed the process, take plenty of notes, because um, you might find that. Um, you just that you decide that you're going to squeeze the grain, in which case mm. you'll, you'll leave less liquid in the in the grain, or that you'll just pick the grain out, wait for it to stop pouring, and then throw it into the into the corner. In which case you'll probably have a, a liter or more. Um, I think that the best idea is to just start with something really simple, like you know a, a simple, easy to understand um, starting point and then just keep refining it until you get to what works for you. Um, That's a good particularly point. Particularly given yeah. that if I say squeeze the grain, you might say, oh, well, I'll just walk up to it and just got to go like that and it's the end of that. Whereas somebody else might go and get themselves a 50-ton a bottle jack from Super Cheap Auto and build some sort of a, 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 you know, a squishing device and squeeze every single, every single bit of liquid out of it. The results will be different. So. Um, I'd say start with one litre or maybe a bit more. Um, if you put more in than is absolutely necessary, you can boil it off later. If you put less than is necessary, then you can add a bit of water later. Um, I think the thing is, make it your best guess. I said hmm. a litre and a bit. Um, start with a ballpark and Yep, and refine. then just do better next time. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's a good point. If you're brewing in a bag, you can squeezing the bag does uh, liberate more liquid. So that, that general guide of one litre per kilo doesn't necessarily apply in that situation. So it depends on your what your process is. Yes. Um, two dogs dancing <laughs> is asking uh, just what was the mineral uh, that you added at the start. I added uh, calcium chloride. Calcium chloride, yep. And that's because I was trying to enhance the perception of maltiness um, from this grain. Um, I am going to be adding an industrial quantity of hops to the thing at the end. I'm trying to make a hoppy beer, but I'd like to have some maltiness in there to help um, balance out the flavour. And so I'm using calcium chloride to, to enhance our perception of maltiness in the finished product. Very good. There are other salts you can add, but we don't want to complicate it too much. I'm trying to be as simple and, uh, as possible. Be as, as simple as we can. Um, but gypsum is the other common salt you may have heard of two dogs uh, that people sometimes add. Uh, it just depends on what your end goal is for the recipe. But uh, that's. And some people like to add magnesium oh, yes, and sulfate, yes. as do I. Um, although too much of that. Um, is not a good thing, but magnesium is good for joint pain and for enhancing um, that sort of crispness, crispness in the final product. But again, um, I'm trying not to be complicated. Yep. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be very simple. I'm a simple man. I'm trying to do a simple, simple. thing. I'm raising the temperature up to about 75 degrees. It's optional. It's purely optional, but um, I like to I like to call it a brew in a bag mash out. By raising the um, the temperature, what I'm doing is um, I'm speeding up the chemical equation that is the, um, the enzymes converting starches into sugars. The vast majority of chemical equations happen faster when you add heat. Um, and as I'm stirring, I'm increasing the chances of um, enzymes encountering starch molecules. They're, um, they're more active, and so I'm hoping to get a little bit more efficiency out of it. Just a little bit more conversion from starch to sugar. Um, a number of other things are happening in here. 
Um, people talk about it being runnier when it's warmer. It is. It's true. I think it's a, I think it's a theoretical thing. Uh huh. Meaning that it's, it doesn't change things enough to truly worry about it. Okay. Um, if you don't want to do it, don't. It's an option. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. An optional extra. Yeah. It is. Um, and that again, it's, so it's just called the mash, the mash out is uh, this process erasing the temperature. A traditional mash out is actually the rest at that final temperature. But with a brew in a bag mash out, I like to think, in fact, I assert, um, the power of assertion is wonderful, um, I assert that it's the process of raising it to that temperature rather than the actual thing. It's the, it's the journey, not the, the journey, not the uh, destination. Yeah, okay. In an ideal world, the, the, um, the last remaining enzyme before it gets denatured by the heat encounters the last remaining starch molecule and turns it into sugar in an ideal world. Mm -hmm. But history will show that that's not where we live. I guess this is a way of adding a bit of efficiency to the, the brew day. It is. The and mash just gets things oh, done a bit quicker. I'm sorry. Um, it does add a bit of efficiency. Um, it adds a little bit of time efficiency. Time efficiency and I guess the other efficiency too. Um, it, it does increase a bit of extraction efficiency. Um, a lot of brewers will talk for quite a long period of time about efficiency numbers. Um, and it's interesting if you like talking about it. Um, the main thing is that if you get, is that every time you brew, if the number is the same, then you know that your process is pretty much spot on. The number doesn't matter too much. Yeah, the consistency part is, is the uh, yes. important bit. I'm there. So I'm going to turn off the power, make a beep that makes Joel wonder if, it's, <laughs> if his camera is good or not. I'm going to lift the bag out now. I'm going to rearrange my table a little bit because hiding below the, the field of the camera is a bucket, uh -huh. which I'm going to empty. Just a white plastic bucket. You can buy them in hardware shops or homebrew shops if they're any good. It's really easy when, when you're playing with small quantities of, of grain. Try doing this with a a 70 litre yeah. batch and you need a gantry crane and whilst every good brewery has a gantry crane maybe not when you're starting <laughs> but definitely some kind of a pulley system is helpful when you start doing bigger batches or a friend a friend to help i think um, an electric winch from super cheap auto ah cool yeah right i have a gantry crane in my brewery which is um starts above the pot and um, it's got a, a rope ratchety type thing so I can lift the bag out and then I can just give it a little zoot and it finds its way over to the to the um, to the sink but today I'm just going to take this put it in this bucket and use this spoon remember I said that I have a way of making things look complicated I'm just going to tie a a knot of some sort in there. And I hope that it works. I think it will. It looks quite tidy. So you just uh, pop the bag in there and let it let it drain a little bit or cool down, I suppose, as well. Uh, it will cool down a bit, but that's okay because we're going to boil it up again. Um, now, if you wanted to, um, at the end of the day, there's going to there is um, as somebody earlier mentioned, and I've forgotten their name. Um, there's going to be a, a fair amount of liquid left in that grain. Um, I can squeeze it out, or I could rinse it out if I wanted mm. to. And by rinsing, there's a whole bunch of different ways. Um, people on some people on the internet will um, try and try 
to pour this through the grain bag or you can um, perform what I understand is known as a dunk sparge. Just treat the thing like a tea bag. I don't know if you can see that, but it's basically got a bit of water in there. You're just sloshing it around. I'm just slopping it around like a ta like a tea bag in a, a thingy, and you can do that for as much for as long or as short a period of time as you want. Tip the liquid in here. Looks a bit clumsy, I know. I'll let that sit there and drain, I think. Yep. And I'll put this on to boil. That's going to take a little while. So I might go and have a drink. Want to go to a break? Let's go to a break. Yeah. Anyone out there can go to have a drink as well. We'll be back in about five minutes. I reckon five minutes sounds like a good round number. Sounds good to me. All right. See back soon.
And we're back. Cool. So, um, we're back. What we've done to date is we've measured some water into the pot. We've brought it up to a nominal temperature of 68 degrees Celsius. We've added some malt and some salts. We've let it steep at 66 degrees for notionally an hour. We cheated a little bit and made it a bit quicker. Um, we've lifted the bag out of the pot and suspended it in, in a bucket where it's subsequently fallen down. Um, <laughs> we're now bringing this to the boil. Um, I'm about to take the liquid that we collected out of here and tip it into the, into the pot um, and prepare for the boil. Very good. So, Jeff, you've actually, I might just pop on screen here. Hello. So, I'm not just some Joel's eerie voice. On screen. Um, uh, yeah, you've broken this down into some, broken this down into some easy to follow steps. Um, there's a document attached in the description of this video down below. You can, anyone who's interested, can download that and follow along. Um, and uh, basically, yeah, we're just, well, you're just following those steps. I today. am. I'm making it look much more complicated than the steps do. <laughs> But um, what I'm trying to do today, what we're trying to do here is to illustrate that it, is, uh, that it really is a fundamentally simple process. Um, you'll have guessed by now that if I can do it, then almost anyone can. But really, um, we shouldn't be letting um, complexity and technical um, stuff get in the way of getting there and brewing. Mm, yeah, um, uh, perhaps an, uh, uh, um, uh, advocating, uh, or not advocating for, uh, I guess what you could call analysis paralysis, um, <laughs> which is something I'm familiar with. Some of us uh, like to get really into researching, <laughs> and I'll put my hand up, I'll put my hand up as well, uh, and get lost in the, in the technicalities and the, the theoretical before even diving into uh, the actual doing of it. So uh, uh, what you're doing today is um, uh, in favour of just, just doing it, just, just, uh, just the process and um, uh, learning, you know, having fun and learning that way. Absolutely. Um, as a corollary, there was a lovely bloke that used to come to our demos many years ago um, who had purchased um, a Braumeister from the shop. Yay. Um, and came to every one of our demos every month for six or 12 months or something, and at no point did he actually brew in his Braumeister um, because he wanted to make sure that he understood all the he elements to get of the it process right. before he started. Sure. Um, so the poor bastard spent 12 months not brewing. Um, I think that you should just get in there and give it a go. The very worst that can happen is that you'll lose, um, that you might make a batch of something that's, that's not, um, not what you wanted to make it, maybe not be as good as you, might, might not be your best batch of beer ever, but you'll have learnt stuff. Even, even if you make um, several litres of undrinkable swill, you'll still have a, a day learning stuff. You, absolutely. Um, and grain is fairly cheap, particularly when you buy it from here and when you, when you um, leverage the joys of um, the grain book and stuff like that. Mm. So the steps that we've covered, or the, if you've covered so far, um, uh, as laid out in the document, you, you, you had the, the preparation, um, which was just getting the water ready and adding your salts, uh, the mash, of course, um, letting the, adding the grains to the water and letting, uh, liberating the sugars that live in, uh, from the starches that live in the grains, uh, lautering or sparging, they're both the same thing, correct? Um, lautering is the process of um, removing the liquid or you know, sort of separating the grain from the liquid. Sparging is rinsing. Is the rinsing part. Yeah, so it's part and parcel of it. Um, I like to think of it as just rinsing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we, it's one thing you learn when you start getting into brewing. We have all uh, our own, our brewers have their own language and terminology. Uh, a lot of it comes yeah. from... That's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Um, a lot of it stems out of, out of Germany, I think, from German, German... I think Lauter is a France. German word. A German word, yeah, a lot of these words come from Germany, I think. Um, but anyway, you can, you can just um, insert your English 
version uh, of it. So they're basically rinsing the grains and now we're up to the, the boil. We're bringing it to the boil. Bringing it to the boil. So, um, not there yet. No, we're not way. quite there yet. Um, it's probably one of the slowest, least interesting parts yeah. of the whole process, bringing it to the boil. Um, I think that's what motivates um, a lot of brewers, particularly male brewers of a certain age, to go out and buy the, the, um, the most powerful heating device that they can find. Um, and so they go to Bunnings and buy a Sun or you know, some other small, small yellow star and try and use that to, to heat their water. Um, most of the time you don't actually need a lot of power to maintain um, a brewing process. Mm. Through the mash we use a very small amount. We needed, a, we needed a bit of power to bring the water from tap temperature to mash temperature. Um, but a little bit of patience and organising your brew day so that other things are occurring whilst, um, whilst that's coming up to speed um, means that you don't notice that too much. There's a bit of time spent waiting for it to come up to the boil now. But um, you could be off making a cup of coffee or pe petting a cat or um, just generally tidying the brew area. Um, you could be watching other, w other people who work in the shop walk past. And, um, but most of the time, um, you don't need an awful lot of power. Um, I think that this induction cooktop is 1800 watts or something like that. So it's, it's, not, it's not very big, not mm -hmm. very powerful. Uh, on the question of power, this might be relevant. Julie is asking uh, if there are any dangers uh, of adding, I guess, direct heat to uh, just on a traditional stove. Um, if uh, she notices that the uh, temperature is dropping too much during Absolutely the not. Um, don't add heaps of, of temperature and make sure that you stir it. Whenever you add heat to the mash, you should be stirring the whole thing. Um, People might will talk about the possibility of um, melting the bag. That's unlikely to happen because most of the, the materials that the bag's made out of um, have got a melting point that's well above the, the boiling point of water. You're not playing in that region at all. You're playing around 60 something, 60 mm. to 70 degrees inside the mash. The main issue that you've got there is that you might make it too hot down the bottom. If you're not stirring it, then the grain will sit on the bottom of the, the pan. It'll act like an insulating layer. You'll get some grain down the bottom that's just too hot, um, which means that all of the enzymes that are currently in that, that part of the world will be denatured. And so the, you're probably going to um, reduce the efficiency of your mash. Don't use too much heat. Whenever you add heat, stir. And you'll be right. And you, you're good to go. And um, a question about the other end of the scale, fermentation. Um, I, uh, Joshua was asking, um, he's fermented a milk stout with ringwood, ringwood ale uh, and it sounds like it got up to about 28 degrees C. Is that too high? Uh, should he be concerned? I've never used ringwood ale, but as a rule of thumb, I like to keep my fermentations below 20 degrees. I think that 28 might start stressing the yeast so that they start um, producing flavours that you're not going to like the taste of. Ultimately, I'd continue on, package it, mm. see what you think. Yep. Um, don't listen to some dickhead in a homebrew shop. Taste <laughs> the beer, see if you like it. And if you don't, do better next time. Yeah, forge your head. Yeah. These things can't be helped. Uh, you know, you work with what you got. And if it got a bit hot in, in the area you're fermenting in, that's, you just roll with the punches. Uh, at some point, you know, one, of the, one thing brewers do early on in there um, well, one of the first things they do early on in their purchasing I don't know what you would call it, habits, uh, getting some kind of <laughs> fermentation chamber, a fridge and uh, a thermostat um, is a, is a, a relatively think, affordable way to improve your beers. Uh, absolutely, tenfold. I think that temperature control of your fermentations is the very best thing that you can do for your brewing. Um, before brewing with grain, um, before moving to kegs. Yep. Um, temperature controlling your fermentations really is the very, the very best thing that you can do to improve your brewing from the point where I suspect that you might be. Um, uh, so it depends it, on, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and it's yeah. not that expensive. I mean, you can, you can do it in all sorts of different ways. Um, um, if you wander into a homebrew shop, for example, this one, um, 
yeah, there's a number of different ways of controlling the temperature of your fermentations. There's, there's some um, fairly inexpensive things if you've got old fridges kicking around. I'm not a fan of old fridges, I like new fridges. Um, energy efficiency and dependability, that sort of stuff. Um, but there are also some really cute things that you can buy that maintain the temperature of the ferment from inside the fermentation de device. Mm. Um, and it's like everything else, there's to do with brewing and probably to do with life, there's a number of different ways to achieve the same thing. Yep. I think the key is to um, understand that nothing's going to be perfect. You like, you find something that you like the general look of, you run with it. You'll yep. make it work. You just will. Yeah. Um, so yeah, space Barry, considerations and... Sorry. No, you go ahead. Yeah. So if Barry tells you that you absolutely must do this thing this way, maybe... <laughs> Maybe don't pay quite so much attention to Barry, um, you know, but I think that certainly as you get older, and I am, a, I am older than I used to be, I've learned that there's less black and white in the world, there's a lot of grey. Most things fall into the grey area. Mm. So find something that you like the look of, run with it. It's yep. true with the brewing system, it's true with the fermenting system. The yeah, yep, exactly. Something, something that works for you, something you can afford, um, and you know, works in the space you've got. Um, uh, Joshua's uh, question to brew jacket. Yes, that is one option. It's yes, certainly an absolutely. option. Um, so, uh, yeah, if uh, they're not cheap, but uh, they are good for what they do and they don't take up a lot of space. So they're good for people if you're a, an apartment dweller, say, um, space is limited, that might be an option. Um, although people, you know, if you've got a garage to play in, um, as Jeff was suggesting, a fridge um, and a thermostat, um, at the simplest uh, end of the spectrum is, is another option. And just for the sake of completeness, um, you could do what I've done, which is um, probably one of the most complicated systems um, around. I've got an old Fisher and Park oil fridge, which um, I happen to know. The, um, the way that they keep the fridge section cool is with a 12 volt fan blowing cold air out of the freezer section. And so, um, I've intercepted the fan and I use a temperature controller to just turn the fan on and off, blowing cold air out of the freezer section into the fridge. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and right. then I built a little, a little heater of my own device um, and I can now temperature control both sections of the fridge freezer um, by using temperature controllers that you buy off the internet and mm -hmm. on and on it goes. Or you can walk into a shop and say, sell me a something. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll cobble together something that works for you. The brew jackets are pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, they're just all in one little system that um, are very um, elegant, I guess you could say. Uh, so yeah, good, I hope that helped you, Josh. Joshua, I should say, if that, you don't want to uh, presume your um, <laughs> nickname. So uh, we're still waiting for the boil still to come up Still waiting for it to here. come to a boil. We're getting quite close. And um, one of the cool things that happens as you approach the boil, as you start getting this scum on the top of the, the liquid, I don't know if it's possible to capture that. Mm, I think from this angle, Probably not. unfortunately not. Well, then you'll just have to imagine some scum on the top <laughs> I'll of insert the... some footage later. <laughs> yes, um, which is, um, which brewers will call a hot break. And it's, um, it's some protein that's, um, because plants have got protein in them, some more than others, grains certainly got some. And um, one of those proteins comes out of solution just before the whole thing starts boiling. And if you want to be really pedantic, you can scoop that out um, and put it aside and throw it out, or you can leave it in there and collect it later on because it'll go back into solution a bit when the thing starts boiling. And um, we'll we'll use um, other means to remove it. Um, one of the joys of brewing for me um, is just watching the various parts of the process and coming to understand what's happening when, so you get a real feel for where you are in in the whole thing. And one of those is watching bits come out of, out of solution, watching what happens when it boils, when you add this, when you add some hops, when you add some finings, um, all those things coming together, they're, um, they're quite fun. I've forgotten to get some hops. Oh. So I'm just gonna run away. You talk amongst yourselves yep. I'll grab some hops. <laughs> Let's see, what can we talk about? How you been? What's it been up to?
some hops. All right, this is what our hops look like. All pre-packaged, vacuum sealed. Vacuum sealed in foil. Um, when you talk to professional brewers particularly, um, regardless of when they're putting their hops in, they'll, they'll often put a couple of hops, just a couple of pellets, or the equivalent of a couple of pellets, in at the very beginning. And they'll talk about nucleation sites. Uh -huh. And protein formation. So protein coagulation, stuff like that. And I propose to do that as well. So this is a trick to perhaps, perhaps prevent boil overs? Is that, is that the right no, idea? It's no, to help, it's to help bring the, um, the proteins out of solution ah. throughout the whole boil. The trick to avoiding boil overs is to use a properly sized pot. Yep. Joel's just nodding at me. <laughs> Sorry, I was distracted by uh, the, the chat, so I missed the joke. Um, I'm sure it was very funny. No, it really wasn't. Um, one of the questions is how big a pot should I use? The, um, the standard rule of thumb is that the, if you're brewing in a bag, the pot should be no smaller than twice the batch size that you're looking to make. Aha, uh -huh, yes, good. Yep. good tip. Um, this is a um, big W 19 litre pot. I'm hoping to make five litres plus two in the pot, seven litres, so I've got enough head space. Mm. Um, this is unlikely to boil over. Yes. But it is kind of boiling at the moment. And I'm going to let that boil for five or ten minutes at full blat. Okay. Um, this is a German brewing technique. Um, as a rule, you don't, want the, you don't want to boil it too angrily. You want the boil to be quite, quite gentle. But um, if you brew it really angrily like it is at the moment, you can see there's a fair bit of, of steam coming off. Um, and that helps us with one of the processes of wort boiling, which is to blow off some, um, some chemicals. And I've managed some volatile, they use some volatile chemicals um, that we don't want in the finished product. Um, and so boiling it really angrily for a short while helps get rid of those. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the boiler can be nice and gentle, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is good from an energy point of view. Um, but also there's some science, which I don't really want to talk about too much, but there is some science that says that the less energy you put into the beer in the boil, um, the longer the beer will last. Mm. So there's this um, relationship between um, boiling it too much and premature staling of the mm. beer. Yeah, yeah that's, that's all something I've been learning about recently or just come to my attention recently so, but uh not not something for beginners to yeah particularly yeah. worry about just know that you're as jeff was saying a, a, a vigorous boil in the beginning and then and then back it off and just a gentle boil from that point onwards um uh, here's a question paul is asking about findings just for yes. a small batch five liter batch do you need findings um doesn't matter what the batch size is whether you need them or not um Findings are things which speed up a process that's going to happen anyway. Um, and so when brewers use findings, all they're really doing is, <coughs> pardon me, um, assisting gravity. Because findings um, take very small particles and clump them together into a bigger particle. And Stokes' law and science tells us that um, big particles will fall out of solution. Fall fall through a, a liquid to the bottom of the container faster than very small particles. Mm -hmm. And so when we add kettle findings, we're just speeding up that process. Okay. The corollary, to, or the, sorry, the, um, the, if you like, the analog to that is that um, if you take a bottle of beer that you made at home, at the, when you, at the beginning it's sort of a bit cloudy, but if you sit in the fridge for a, a few weeks, then it gets clearer and clearer as time goes by. And that's simply because everything's just falling out of solution. Sorry, falling, falling out, it's not falling out, is it? It's just falling it's down. Falling down? Oh, it's yeah, falling sure. Down. It's falling down. Um, and if you don't use findings, it's going to happen anyway. Um, but when you do use findings, it happens it quicker. It happens a bit quicker. Uh -huh. um, in the context of this, there's a, there's a joy that happens with using a no-chill process, and that is that it's going to be sitting this thing at least overnight, maybe a couple of days, depending upon when you get to actually um, taking the 
the liquid out of the no-chill cube and putting into your fermenter. Um, if you want to, you can carefully pour the liquid out of the no-chill cube into the fermenter and leave a whole bunch of that yuck in the, in the no-chill cube, in which case you could argue that um, you don't need findings, you don't need to spend any time at all getting stuff out of here into there. Mm. Um, as a point of endeavour, I like to use every time I transfer liquid from somewhere to somewhere else as an opportunity to leave behind some of the stuff that I don't want in the finished beer. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a, it's not a scientific, it's not a technical explanation, it's just the way Personal I like to do things. preference. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so if you're brewing the way that Jeff brews, um, then you would, you, you'll use findings in the kettle, as I will here, um, and you'll try and keep as much of that yuck in here as possible. Um, certainly there are other brewers, very credible brewers, um, very well um, meddled brewers who don't bother with that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think that one of the cool things about home brewing is that you get to focus on precisely what you want to focus on. Uh, we're getting, uh, we've got a visitor from uh, the US. Welcome to the show, Julia. Ooh, a bit late in the day for you. It must be. Yeah, she's uh, saying that she's um, just stumbled across our video and she's going up to do her second brew in a bag tonight. Well, he... um, it, it could be. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to presume. Um, uh, and uh, any other... So, so, oh, okay, so it looks like she may have had some attenuation problems with the last batch. Uh, it's early, oh, okay. Um, hmm. Must be early in the morning. Um, uh, Time zone's not my strong point. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of the many I'm things not, that are not my strong point. Not mine either. I'll appear, I'll pop on screen here. So, um, I guess she's asking if there's any other... Um, we may cover these as we go, but um, uh, tips uh, to avoid mistakes that might create a beer that result uh, a low ABV when you're not aiming for a, yes. a low ABV. Um, and it's, it's hard to say for sure. Um, one of the things that you may want to look at is um, how long you've mashed and at what temperature. Um, the longer you mash, the more um, the enzymes will have work, will continue to work. Um, it's possible that if you mash at too high a temperature, then you will not be favouring or you'll be, de you'll be denaturing and not favouring um, the enzymes that create the sugars that go on to create alcohol. Um, because you might have, if the beer has a lot of mouthfeel, um, then that's a, a hint. So one thing would be to mash at 62 degrees for a little while and then raise the temperature to a higher mash temperature. One is just to let the mash go for a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, if that's the problem, yep. um, it, could, it could also be about yeast health, uh -huh. it could be about a bunch of things, and so um, I can't tell you exactly what's causing it, but things to play with might be yeah, reducing your mash temperature, reducing the mash length. Yep, and, um, and maybe pitching more yeast, yes. just as an option. Uh, she's uh, surmised that it could be the mash, a mash temp issue, so yeah. A lot of people uh, do focus on mash temperature um, and I'm not entirely convinced that it plays as big a part as possible. That it is easily possible to, to make it way too hot um, and denature some enzymes that are going to you know, and, and affect that. Um, but certainly a good place to start is to mash low. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're, doing, you're stirring the, the mash a lot. Uh, make sure you're stirring a lot. Um, Think about your water, add some calcium to the water maybe. Mm -hmm. um, those sorts of general, you know, it's general advice. Yep. Uh, but general advice is good advice. Yep. Mash, mash low, mash long. Uh, perhaps uh, you could re-watch this video from about the 19, 19 minute point, Julia. Uh, Jeff sort of goes through the mash um, uh, from 19 minutes to uh, about 50 minutes thereabouts. Maybe there's some tips in there. Yeah. You can pick up. But uh, good luck. Yes, um, uh, people have might, fun. That's might the main talk thing. about grain bill and stuff like that. Um, my guess is that it's probably just some small thing that you're overlooking. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you've not done a lot, then you haven't quite got into muscle memory yet. Um, um, I know that my first couple of brews, mm. I approached with um, a more than unusual amount of trepidation. Um, and it was only your first brew, so um, you did well, you made beer. Yes. That's an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you could do just for, um, for the fun of it would be to take a bottle of your beer and put some champagne yeast in it. Oh yeah. And see that if you can reduce the, the, um, the gravity of it a bit. Um, that might tell you something as well. I hope that there's something there to, to consider. So we're still boiling there. Uh, do you have time for another question? Always. Always. All right, another question. Uh, we've got Paul again. Uh, he's asking about malts. Do different malts need to be mashed at different times? Hmm. I'm just trying to find the best way to address that. Um, I don't think so. Um, the thing about different malts is, apart from the different sort of grain that they come from, um, which might mean whether it's a winter crop or an um, autumn crop, um, is how long it's been kilned for. So in, the, in a very rough sense, um, an ale malt is a Pilsner malt that spent a little bit longer in the kiln. Um, and so it's um, been browned a bit more. And a Vienna malt is an ale malt that spent a bit longer in the kiln. And a Munich malt is a Vienna malt that spent a little bit longer in the kiln. And at that point you, you've got enough, you've spent enough time in the kiln where you're starting to remove or kill off all of the enzymes that are in the malt. So by the time you get to um, brown malt, black malt, there's no, no enzymes available. So you're going to have less, less enzyme um, in the darker base malts. Mashing for longer might give you a better yield. But I wouldn't say that as a rule of thumb, longer mash with less diastatic power is a great thing. I'd be trying to add um, some more enzymes to a darker malt. Mm. Have, I, have I addressed the question or have I just spoken for a minute or two? <laughs> <laughs> it, probably both. Yeah. Hard to say. Uh, there's a, yeah, of course, uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure if, uh, you, you were just answering this then either, but uh, and I don't want to overcomplicate things, but there are people who, when making stouts and darker beers, will mash. Uh, we'll put a portion of the grains uh, in the fridge overnight, but I guess we get that's a sort of a set, we're getting into some separate territory there. Yes. Uh, as, a, as a general rule, you, no, you don't need to mash. You know, unless there's, you're experimenting or trying something out um, for, for mm. any beginners out there. Mashing not, any mash, any given mash for a thing. longer period of time is going to change the, the, um, the, quality of the finished product for sure. And that's one of the reasons that traditionally, with a traditional brewing setup, um, brewers will affect a mash out. And that is to fix the sugar quote, um, um, makeup of the wort by, by killing off or by denaturing all of the enzymes. Um, and so that says, well, you, know, you, could, you can then say that, use, or use that as an argument to say that mashing longer will change the quality of the, of the wort. Certainly, I think the, if you leave it mash longer, you'll get a runnier wort. You'll get a more boozy wort. Um, but does that mean that I have to mash longer for a given type of base malt? I wouldn't say so. I hope that uh, clarifies things a little bit, Paul. Feel free to say if it hasn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll spend, I think, we'll I spend think some he, more time. <laughs> <laughs> he, seems, uh, he seems happy with that. And uh, Julia's, um, I think, said earlier that uh, the beer was tasting all right, so that she made, so that's good. I'm going to spend more time making less boozy beer. Um, I'm a fan of drinking beer. I'm not a fan of getting drunk. Yeah, yeah, I, yep, I'm, I'm pursuing a similar endeavour. 
have been for some time, you know. Uh, session beers that are tasty and um, can enjoy, but don't, don't leave you slaughtered at the end of a, yes. a few of them. Some of my friends don't understand what I'm saying to them when I say this, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, quadruple IPAs are great, but... Uh, I like to be able to sit down and drink two or three pints yeah. of beer. Um, and you can't do that with a quad IPA if you intend on standing back up again. Mm. I'm going to refer to my notes. There's a, a number of things happening in the boil. Um, when we boil this liquid, um, we're reducing the volume, which is concentrating the, the sugars in there. Um, we're sanitizing it. Not too many things can, can survive being boiled for an hour, um, which is a good thing um, because we want this thing to last. Um, we're going to introduce some yeast into it later. We want the yeast to be the only thing that's going to eat the sugars. That way we have a dependable outcome. We don't know what's in here. Um, could have been anything because ultimately um, malt is an agricultural product and you don't know where it's been. <laughs> so um, we want to kill off any of the nasties that, that happen to find their way in there on the, on, the, um, on the grain or in the water or anywhere else. Um, mm. We're trying to drive off um, some of the volatiles that might, might add flavours to the finished product that we don't like. Um, but we're also going to be adding hops in a traditional brew, um, brew, brew session. Yeah, good. I, I blanked then too, so yes. yeah, you're looking at me for help. And I, 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 can't, I got nothing. <laughs> I'm not very, I'm not often... Uh, Helpful in, the, in times of need like that. My, my recall is, is shocking. Um, we're adding hops, and the hops, from hops we get three things. We get bitterness, um, we get flavour, and we get aroma. And that comes from um, boiling or from, from adding the hops at different times throughout the process. And traditionally, we would add hops at the very beginning of the boil, and from that we would get a lot of bitterness, which helps to... Um, People say that bitterness balances um, the sweetness of the malt. Um, we then add hops later on just for the, for the beautiful flavours that we get from the hops. And then we'll add some at the very last moment to um, add um, aroma. In reality, there's a spectrum of bitterness, flavour and aroma that comes out of those hops. Um, and I, when I'm making this, I want to make a, a, a very hoppy beer in terms of flavour. I want it to be a flavoursome beer. I'm relying on the fact that um, the, um, no chilling the wort by putting it into a, um, a no-chill cube and letting it sit there and cool down naturally. And so um, I know that if I add the right amount of hops to get a big hoppy flavour, then I'm going to be in the ballpark of the right amount of bitterness. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a, a a uh, train of thought among a lot of brewers these days that you almost don't even worry about what the bitterness is, that mm. if you get the flavour right, everything else just happens by itself. Yep. <clears throat> so I'm going to be adding all of my hops at the very end of the boil, in fact after I've turned off the heat, um, so that I can get a lot of the flavour out of the hops and I assert that I'm going to get the right amount of bitterness. Yep. Um, so, a in a traditional beer. brew session, I would have added some hops um, for bitterness. I added a couple here, but not enough to really do anything much. Um, um, not in terms of adding to, the, adding to the bitterness, but in a traditional brew session, I would have added some hops for bitterness, and then I'd be maybe 10, 20 minutes from the end of the boil, I'd be adding some more with the notion of getting um, some flavour out of them, and then some at the very end to get some aroma. That's a good segue, Josh. Why is just prior to you... Uh talking about hops there, he was asking about any tips for scheduling, uh, hop scheduling for IPAs. And that, that's, yes. that's pretty much it. The, the, the current uh, trend is all the hops go in at the end. And um, yeah, almost to the point of not worrying about bittering additions or anything, just, just a heap of hops at the end, dry hopping, um, 
commercial brewers, uh, professional brewers, I believe, rely on grams per litre is, is the thing that they use, as opposed to IBUs or any other measuring sort of scale, they, they just go on grams per litre. So I think for IPAs, mm -hmm. it's anywhere from 12 to 15. Dean, I'm sort of talking the numbers about my there, but, but yeah, they, they talk about grams per grams of hot material per litre. That gets complicated when you look at what what it truly means, because mm. different hops have different, different amounts of the, the 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 good oil, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah. Um, and so it depends upon the um, the variety of the hop and what you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, I think people are, are moving away from IBUs mm. as a as a measure. Yep, as a, as a, exactly, yeah. And in fact, uh, Josh, um, uh, Ben and I had a good discussion on this last stream, which was our West Coast, I'll pop back up here, uh, West Coast IPA stream, which is obviously a style of beer that has a lot of hops in it. Uh, if you check out that video, have a look in the chapters, in the time timestamps. I think I put a section in there where we talked about hopping and you might get some tips in there specifically to IPAs. Um, but I believe it's, it's around 12 to 15 grams a litre is sort of what they talk about for IPAs. But then when you add them is, you know, that's, that's sort of a, a personal thing, but you could assume that later in the boil is, is generally when, when they all go in. Um, but there's lots of ways you can, you can approach it. The, the, the traditional way is uh, you put your First edition, your bittering edition in at 60 minutes, and then you've got 30 minute edition, say, and then 15, and they stagger it that way. It's another option. We talk all about all that um, in that stream, so you might want to check that out. Uh, it's part of the joy of um, the artistry, if you like. Yeah. Um, these days, most of the beers that I'm making, because I really like hop flavours, I tend not to add any, any hops to the boil. And in fact, um, um, Joel and Ben came to my place and we brewed a big batch of beer a little while ago. And it was just vast quantities of hops at, <laughs> at different temperature levels in the whirlpool. So we turned off the flame and as the wort cooled slowly, we would just add hops. Add and then hops. It, when it got to another temperature level, we'd add some more hops. And, um, and um, apart from generating a wonderful smell in the, in the brew house, mm. um, it does result in a completely different sort of flavor to a traditional bittering schedule. Um, and it's fun. Yeah, it's fun, and there was no any particular science behind it. I think or any measurement. We just sort of chucked them in as yeah. we felt uh, once you know we hit certain temperatures. And that's one of the cool things Winged is it. that um, is that if you allow yourself to just be taken by the the voyage of discovery, the journey, then. Um, serendipitously you can find yourself making all sorts of yummy things and learning all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, I, I, I really don't like to be prescriptive about what I'm doing. I like to describe what I'm doing. Um, it's, and that's because I, I'd like to think that people un, what, understand how to do something and then go off on their own different way and, and experiment. Adapt it. Mm. And Navinator is asking a question about rainwater. Uh, this is a question that comes up a lot, actually, it really is. In, in live streams. Uh, so lots of, lots of you out there are, um, have, uh, are relying on tank water. Uh, I will, uh, I'm planning to make this a standalone video. We, we've had some good discussions on this in the past. Uh, so obviously it's a question that keeps coming up. Um, so Navinator, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Similar to Josh, I'll refer you to, and I'm pretty sure we covered in, in the last stream as well, Ben and I in the West Coast IPA stream. Have a look at that. It'll be on our channel up towards the top of the screen there. Um, and yeah, again, look through the timestamps. There'll be a chapter, I'm pretty sure, on how to handle rainwater. Uh, it's, it's quite a lengthy discussion. In short, um, I've been brewing Go with for rainwater it. for the past 13 years. Um, and let me describe to you what I think the process okay, yeah, go of for it. the sure, water if you got, yep. is. That um, I live in the country um, where there are trees and cars on the road and birds sitting on my TV antenna. The water falls through the sky and onto my colour bond roof. Birds sitting on the TV antenna shit on my roof. Mm -hmm. um, people driving up and down the road raise, rust, um, raise dust 
from the laneway, which eventually falls onto the roof. Um, the occasional leaf and stuff like that falls onto the roof. When it rains, all that gets washed through my downpipes into a plastic collection tank, passing through a really coarse screen. Uh -huh. So it's nicely seasoned. Yes. Um, <laughs> and depending upon the time of the year or when it last rained, the water coming off the roof itself will be different because there'll be different amounts of bird shit uh -huh. or different um, amounts of dust or different qualities of the dust if the council's graded the laneway or not. Oh, yes. um, there'll be different, different types of, um, of um, vegetable matter from trees and things that have fallen onto the gutter. But once it's set in my um, plastic collection tank, it sits there and settles for a while. And then I pump it up uh, some black poly pipe into 188,000 litre um, plastic lined steel tank. Prior to that, it was a concrete tank. It's 180,000 litres. You would expect that whatever the quality of the water is, it's going to change over time because it's, it's a comparatively small amount of water and the inputs are going to change. Mm. So <coughs> um, for me, it's an interesting challenge versus a municipal water supply, which is hundreds or thousands of gigalitres with, profe um, with trained professionals um, employed to maintain it between particular limits. Yeah, At my place, it's just me. Uh -huh. No, yes. And I'm yes, lazy. Yes. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm doing. And so my rainwater is not going to be as consistent from season to season as a, as a municipal water supply. Um, but, I, but when I'm brewing, I do essentially treat it as being fairly innocuous. I don't, um, from time to time, I might put a peroxide-based sterilant into the collection tank, but most of the time it's just as it falls off and I let the, the, um, the natural organisms do that thing, which is a small amount of science that I'm becoming aware of that says that um, if you just let it go, if you filter out most of it, then it tends to look after itself. Uh -huh. um, I run it through a couple of carbon block filters and we brew with that. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm adding my salts, I, I just ignore the water profile. Right. For me, brewing is about adapting to the water that you have. <laughs> there are some, um, like some of the most um, celebrated home brewers in the world, Gordon Strong among them, um, goes to the shop and buys demineralized water. Oh, yes. It's an absolute blank slate and then adds minerals to it. I have a different view, which is one of the reasons why I've probably not won too many medals at brewing competitions, the other being I've never entered one. Um, that you brew with the water you've got. And so I think, use the water. If you think, yeah, it needs a bit of this or a bit of that, then add a bit of this, a bit of that, um, and just learn to live with what you've got. Maybe experiment a bit and batch to batch. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, but again, if, you're, if your water's varying uh, then you just month to month or season to season, you're constantly uh, having to adapt, I suppose. But I think so. Um, more or less treat it as a, as a bit of a blank canvas. I mean, there's going to I be do. some minerals in there, obviously, yes. but... Um, as I say, I, I filter it. Um, I run it through a five, mil, a 5 micron and then a 0 0.5 micron carbon block filter, so two carbon block filters, and I say that that's as good as I can do. Yep. Um, and, the, um, and even though I know that it's not a great way to, to approach it, the water tastes okay. Yeah. <laughs> And it usually tastes reasonably similar, but I'm, but um, pedantically, I think it does change over time. Mm -hmm. um, I think, for me, yeah, just working with what you've got is more important or more um, renders more joy. Yes, yeah. Uh, so just maybe ballpark a, a, a bit of calcium and um, yes, and chloride and, and um, sulfate. Uh, sulfate. Thank you. Um, just. And the amounts may vary. That's something you might have to dial in over time. Yes. Um, I believe um, that, ex that trial and error and experimentation when it comes to this sort of stuff is always going to yield a better result than theorising. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy to accept that somebody might do it differently and better. Yes. There's if anyone else out there actually is on tank water and has any difference, uh, has any advice or tips, Chuck them in the comments or the description below. Um, and as I said, uh, Navinator, have a look through the, the past streams and you'll find some similar discussions and um, you might pick up some tips there. But basically we cover the, the same things that we just suggested.
So we hope that helps. Joel hopes that helps. Way. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have we been, been boiling for? To be perfectly Just... frank, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not measuring. I'm, I'm looking at it and, and I'm boiling it down to um, a volume. Uh -huh. okay, because you're going on. Yep. Um, really, the, um, as long as you've boiled it for half an hour or more, um, then you're going to get most of the most of the action that you get from boiling. Mm -hmm. um, I know that that's it's not a hundred percent solution, mm -hmm. but I think that for first boil, for you know the first couple of brews, trying to get your get your head around the process, it's certainly good enough. Um, I'm, I intend brewing tomorrow, where I'm probably going to be boiling for an hour and a half. I'm going to time that boil. But for this process, I'm looking for a volume. I'm boiling until I get that volume, and I'm almost there as it happens. Um, I assert that it has been boiling for long enough, as I say, to, to perform those actions of removing volatiles, um, helping to get proteins out, um, killing any cat that found its way in there during mm -hmm. when I wasn't looking. Um, it's not the way that everybody brews, but I do think it's a great way to get your head around the basic process. I am nearly at that point. All right, and so you're aiming for, so you've got, uh, ultimately it's going to be going into a five litre jug. Yes. Uh, so I assume your volume you're aiming for is a little above that five litres. It is. Um, earlier on, at the very beginning, um, I poured water into this pot until it started falling out of the tap. That accommodates the dead space in the kettle. Yes. I then filled up my cube with water and poured that in. I measured from the top of the pot down to the level of the water, and I know that that's how much liquid I must have in the kettle mm -hmm. at the end of this process. There you go. I measured 14 centimetres. It's currently at about 13 centimetres from the top. So I could just stop now, mm -hmm. you know, on the... Call it close enough. Yep, I could call it close enough um, because it's taking too long or because I want to accommodate the possibility of making a mistake. Um, when you're me, that's a really good strategy. <laughs> um, me too. But also because um, I think that we probably, you've probably seen enough of me standing in front of a kettle that's boiling. I'm going to measure it again though. There is a, um, a document, I think it's, um, I think it's been plastered somewhere associated with this, which has got the, the process of determining the volume, um, how, much, how much liquid to add to the, to the yeah, thing. Yeah, we do have a rundown on the websites, I believe. Um, as part of my Easy Brew document, uh -huh. I think, page two, is Jeff's Easy Volume, five steps. <laughs> so there's a, a, another method there, if anyone is in, in, interested. I, I did want to, I, was, I don't know what, what was going on with YouTube this week, but I was going to pop it in the comments, but uh, it's in the description. There's a link to Jeff's file. You can download and follow along if you like. And that contains all the steps that he's um, uh, undertaking today, including uh, on the second page, uh, his yeah, little guide for determining your, your water volume. which is uh, actually well worth getting your head around as a beginner. That was something I put off for a long time. Water calculations and, um, and such. And as a result, I was sort of haphazardly uh, missing my numbers at the end of every brew day. I was either brewing, winding up with too much liquid, not enough. Uh, I was having, well, not attenuation problems, but um, uh, what would you say? Um, I was making beers that were not consistent, um, either too under under ABV or over ABV, and just I just I was all over the shop. So yeah, dialing in your um, water calculations at the beginning, and maybe maybe this is something to look at too, Julia. I don't know if this is a, something that was happening in your case, but um, uh, yeah, um, getting your head around the. How to calculate your water up front is, is, is it definitely yeah. worthwhile. I suppose it's about knowing yep. your equipment. That's yep. an important part of the process. I, mean, I think the process and recipe go hand in hand. 
but the process is absolutely essential. Mm. Um, and that's why I'm trying not to, to overcomplicate any of, any of the process that I'm doing here today. In fact, I'm, I mean, you can see I mean, I'm approaching it with, a, with that typical level of deafness. You know, <laughs> that, you know, we're, we're not really measuring much, we're not pl applying any science, we're waffling a bit, but really all we're doing is steeping some grain in some water and then boiling it. We did the thinking by following the process of, of, um, that we've just outlined in the, in the easy volume steps mm. so that we don't have to think. A couple of simple, simple steps at the beginning saves you a lot of heartache at the end. That's one of the cool things about um, brewing a bag as a, as a system, I think, is that you get to do all of your thinking up front. If you follow the traditional brew in a bag system where it's um, not only is it single vessel but it's full volume mashing, which means that you add at the very beginning of the process mm. all of the water all that you're going water, to yeah, use. Yeah, that's really, yeah. That's and the, so the you key. do all of your thinking up front and, and, take care of. and then it's just follow the process. Yeah. Um, I wanted to call it a 12 step process but <laughs> I thought that would be a bit rude. Um, but, and there aren't 12 steps. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you really, I'm stretching it to make it eight steps. Um, I've just um, rehydrated, or I'm trying to rehydrate, which basically means turn into a slurry, um, a thing called Brewbrite, which is a kettle fining. It's um, comprised of two things. One is carrageenan, which is um, stuff that you'll find um, as um, copper flock, Irish moss, um, there's another mm. um, copper flock kettle, um, oh, yeah, mumble okay. flock. I think there's some American products here. escape me at the moment, um, but yeah. It's, it's a seaweed ice extract. Cream. I know that. Sorry? It's in ice cream. It is. It's in a number of things. Um, but it's, it works well as a kettle fining because it helps to clump together um, a lot of the stuff that's in this liquid. Um, but Brewbright also has um, a... Um, a long chain polymer, which is abbreviated to PVPP, and I used to know it, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, it's sold sometimes as polyclar, um, and that's really cool because it um, is meant to help remove um, polyphenols, which occur mm. in hops and in grain and contribute to chill haze. Mm. Um, but the best thing about Brewbrite is that when you stick it in there, it works so so quickly, it's just fun to watch. It is, it is kind of magical, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of a dual action, and it's got a, two ingredients in there that kind of work, attack the, the um, proteins from two different angles. Uh, and the idea is you wind up with, well, uh, similar to, I guess this is, was, I think it was Paul's question about adding um, uh, findings. findings. It just, yeah. it just speeds up, yeah, the process, and you wind yeah. up with clearer wort. I don't want to. I don't want to talk science, but Stokes' law tells us that big things <laughs> fall through liquid faster than little things. Yeah, that's all you need to know. And you wind up with clear wort, and that's good. Brewers love clear wort because beer drinkers like clear beer, unless you come from South Australia. Man. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> I quite like a Dr. Tim's from time to time. Go on off it. The, Coop, um, the Cooper's Brewery is really interesting. They have a, um, a, a mash press as part of their mashing system. Oh, which yeah. Is, um, from a, made by a company called Miura in, in New Zealand. Um, and it squeezes the, the living daylights out of the grain at the end so yeah. they get. Um, Totally dry um, grain yeah. at one side and lots of liquid at the other yeah. side. Um, and so they actually get um, um, what is on the surface um, an impossible efficiency out mm, of their mash yeah. system. Yeah. 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 And that's for another day, but that's a really cool system, just pressing the bejesus out of the, out of the grain. It's amazing to think of, isn't it? So it just goes to show that uh, for those of you out there who think squeezing your brew in a bag bag is bad, Say that five times Ooh, fast. Yeah. Say it again. Uh, no, say it again. Say it again. <laughs> brewing, for those of you who think that brewing, oh, no, it's gone. <laughs> that was a once in a lifetime uh, fluke. Uh, but yes, uh, there, there's, a, there's a thought out there that squeezing the brew in a bag bag is bad. There you go. 
yeah. and because uh, you extract tannins and other nasties. But um, commercial breweries, uh, breweries are using hydraulic presses uh, to squeeze their grains. Then um, squeezing your bag at home is not going to be a problem. Through the power of assertion, I'd say that we've boiled this enough. I'm going to, I'm going to turn it off. So I'm just going to let it sit there for a few minutes. Um, mm -hmm. <coughs> pardon me. Um, I'm just going to let it sit for maybe five or ten minutes. Okay. And then I'm going to throw some hops in there. So I think now might be a good time for me to have a break. Have a rest. Yep. All right. Everyone will give it five minutes. Uh, you guys can uh, have a break as well. Grab yourselves a drink. Go or... get some beer. <laughs> Your beverage of choice, and we'll be right back.
We're back. So, I've, I've turned off the boil, I've turned off the heat on the boil, I've added some um, kettle finings, um, and during the break I removed the cleaner from my no-chill cube, I'm giving it a rinse and I'm just about to put some sanitizer in it because I believe that everything that the work touches should go through the clean, rinse and sanitize process. We clean it, we use a good quality cleaner, in our case um, sodium bicarbonate, to remove all of the soil, that's the yeast and other sorts of yuck from the surface of the object. We then use a lot of clean, fresh water to rinse away the cleaner and the, the stuff that's in, in suspension. And then we use a sanitizer to kill the bugs that are in the rinse water. Clean, rinse, sanitize. And I believe that we do that to everything that the work's going to touch. There's a point of view that says that <clears throat> this is quite hot and so it's going to kill things on the way through and that is absolutely true. But I'm going to use two cents worth of, of sanitizer and another five cents worth of cleaner and it's a belt and braces thing. Mm. It's like um, insurance or any of those sorts of um, um, things, for lack of a better expression. <laughs> a bit of redundancy. Yeah. Um, in that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm increasing my chances of success. Mm. What we've done at the moment is pretty easy to achieve in terms of, um, of sanitation. <clears throat> the boil is going to kill off a lot of things, most of the things. But from now on, um, everything that we do will be characterised by our ability to keep um, the environment that the work goes into clean and sanitary and to pitch the right amount of yeast. Um, by pitching the right amount of yeast, we're going to close the gap on those bugs that probably might get through through our sanitation process and increase the chances of success. But back to here, um, I've cleaned it, I've rinsed it, I'm now just going to put a bit of sanitizer in, I've got to make that up from scratch. Um, I'm using um, a five star chemical product called, um, called SaniClean, which is um, phosphoric acid and a, um, a surfactant which is a wetting agent and the thing that allows a lot of um, a lot of soap companies to say that their hand sanitise, their hand washing detergenty things kill 98.5% of germs and things like that. I see. It's important to use the right amount of, of um, sanitizer concentrate. Um, more does, is not better, it's not like a lot of things. Um, with, a, with a cleaner, more is better. Mm. With a sanitizer, more is not necessarily better, but it is certainly more expensive. Yeah, okay. So yeah, at a certain point, you're not achieving extra killing power, you're just wasting sanitizer. Correct. And sanitizer is not very expensive, but if you're looking to save money, then one way of doing it is to use the right amount of everything. Mm -hmm. And if this thing is perfectly clean, then I get to use this again. The manufacturer, um, never argue with a man how to use his product. <laughs> and so when, the, um, when the, the label on the packaging says to leave it, leave it um, in contact with the surface for five minutes, do exactly that. Yep. I've got this really big bench and yet I've still managed to make it look cluttered. It's the way. My wife would be able to explain to you why that is. And in essence, it's because I'm me. That must be a, a fairly common occurrence. I think if there's a surface in my house, I've got it covered in crap. Covered in something. <coughs> so you uh, just poured a bit into a spray bottle and the rest is gone into a, a jug there, I see. Into a jug, yep. And that's because 
I'm sorry. I've also got this noisy stuff done. I like making noise. Um, I'm going to run this down a down a hose into the, the cube and I wanna I wanna sanitize this. I've I washed it and rinsed it previously because I understand that for some people watching Jeff clean rinse and sanitize things can be boring. So there's one you prepared earlier, it's been cleaned. Uh, let's see if I can adjust the camera here a bit. So that all goes into the jug. Make sure you get it on the inside as well as the outside. It's the in, so make inside sure the whole thing. Yep. No problem with sanitizing your hands. That's all good. And I'll just let that drain. It's a little bit foamy, not very foamy, but a little bit. I'll come back and do that a bit later. Okay. So now I can get back to focusing on my wort. <clears throat> Easy brew step, so to leave it till about 90 degrees and then to add some hops. If I'm, if I'm um, making a, um, a grain and grape fresh wort kit cube volume, which is 16 and a half litres, then I'm probably going to use two 40 gram packs of hops. Um, here I'm making this five litres, so I'm going to scale that back so it becomes about 30 grams of galaxy that I'm going to stick in there today. But again, you get, you get to choose how much you use. Kind of rhymes. I'm not going to be too precise. There's no need to be too precise. These scales go down to about one hundredth of a gram. Some might argue that that's overkill. But at least I can tell you how wrong I'm going. <laughs> Galaxy hops. Yes, yes, nothing's <laughs> finer. I'm just going to put them in there like that. Give it a bit of a stir. Okay, so this is the whirlpool. This is Jeff's attempt at a whirlpool. <laughs> um, I want to get the whole work spinning. I'm not trying to create the world's biggest vortex. I just uh -huh. want to get it spinning. Um, and what's going to happen there is that Stokes law again, um, along with conservation of angular momentum um, and gravity and, um, and the best of good intentions will result in all of that hot matter and the proteins and stuff forming a nice little cone in the bottom of the, the pot and that'll be surrounded by clear wort, which we're going to decant off into here in about 10 minutes or so. Hmm. And the idea is you wind up with what you want in the cube and what you don't want, mostly, stays in the pot. That's right. One of the cool things about no-chill um, as a process is that if you want to be really, truly pedantic, then some stuff will find its way into the bottom of the cube. Uh -huh. um, there's an interesting um, experiment that the guys on the Brewlosophy website did where um, they challenged the notion of um, keeping all of the kettle yuck or uh, yerk out of the fermenter yeah. and they did a side by side of um, try to get as little as possible into the fermenter and try and, and pay no attention to it at all. Um, and I believe that they said that they couldn't, that there wasn't that much of a difference. Mm, right, yeah, um, interesting. But I think that the difference between good beer and great beer is a series of really small steps. Yes, yep. And that um, if you leave out too many of them, then it's, then, you know, you can have beer that's maybe not as good as you can make. Uh -huh. But also, Part of what I like to, why I like to do this is that I get to focus on various elements. If I, um, if I, if I keep um, a bunch of solids in here that I assert I don't want in the fermenter, if I keep them in here, then I get more actual usable liquid in here. Mm. And so it increases my end-to-end -end system efficiency. Um, I don't like talking about efficiency too much, yep. but I think that what does matter 
is efficiency into mouth. Yes, yes. <laughs> that um, there's all different ways where you, places where you can lose efficiency by leaving behind liquid that you might be able to use. Um, and that happens in every container that the beer is in, including the fermenter. Because you know, when, you, when you're um, bottling or packaging stuff out of the fermenter, there's a fair bit of pretty disgusting stuff that you want to keep in the fermenter. And, and mm. if you really, really want to avoid that, then you'll leave some perfectly good fluid in the fermenter. Mm. Yes, yep, yep, yep. Unavoidable. And, mm. Yeah, and if you bottle an iKeg, yep. then you're going to leave some in the bottom of your bottle. Yep. A little bit, every step of the way, a little bit gets left behind, yeah. right. Yep. And then if we're drinking together and, um, and you're very careful and you drink everything that's in your, in your pint glass, whereas I'm a, I'm a bit of a, um, a bit of an embarrassment to everyone. I might sort of spill a fair bit <laughs> out of the glass before it gets into my mouth. Well, you know, it's more lost. I've lost efficiency there. So um, if efficiency can be picked up or lost all along the way. Sure. Um, and I think that if you pay reasonable attention to each one of those steps, then you know, you'll do pretty well at the end of the day. Yeah, I right. Think. Yeah, good <clears throat> tip. All these little, all the little steps can add up. It's a bit like cleaning up as you go along. Yeah. Which I haven't done. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. I haven't done any cleaning up as, as we go along here. Do um, as we say, not as we do. Um, we have a we have a little a fleet <laughs> of humans that come in after we're done and, right. yeah, and clean sure. it up for us. Um, back to an earlier question, if we've got time. Uh, I think this will be a fairly quick one to answer. Um, Jimmy's asking about leaving, uh, I guess, uh, removing chlorine from water. We were talking about yes. tips earlier. Uh, is simply leaving the water out overnight enough to dechlorinate or reduce the chlorine? You know, you know. I have heard people say that, that, that it is enough. Mm. And I've heard people say that you can boil it beforehand. Um, I've never done either of those things. I prefer to run it through a filter because it's time efficient. Mm, yeah, oh, it's not something I've done, do myself. Mm -hmm. uh, just run it through a filter, um, chlorine filter. Oh, but I've heard that's what people do. Yeah. I under, my understanding is that that is a thing people do and that it works. So yeah. um, I suppose, yeah, there's, there's multiple angles you can attack anything from like we um, have said, uh, and that's one. I propose that's a test. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the cool things is that Everyone has, we're in, a, um, we're in this really interesting sort of pastime where there's a fair bit of science, there's a fair bit of practice or technique. And um, in big breweries, there are people who are employed to focus on the science because it means real money. Mm. At a home brewer level, we can afford to just sort of try it. Um, and we can also jump in and say, oh, I'm detecting this problem with my beer. <laughs> I wonder what the cause is. So we go back to a bloke I spoke about earlier who was trying to, before he did his first brew, was trying to anticipate all of the problems that could possibly happen and how he would mitigate those problems before he got to brew. Um, some of those problems he might never have actually encountered ever. And so, Maybe he was suffering a bit of analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. My view is jump in, give it a shot. So um, you could just pull water straight out of the tap and try brewing with it. Mm -hmm. And then if you say, oh no, that's not, that has got a weird flavor. Oh, well then maybe I should just try leaving it overnight. Yep. And if that fixes the problem, then yay, win. If not then, and if you're convinced that the problem is the chlorine, then you could try another, go another route. Um, so again, I've not, I've not done it. I've read of people doing it. What's the worst that can happen? Mm, yeah. <clears throat> I hope that addresses the question, even if it doesn't answer it. But thanks for the question, Jimmy. I Ooh, hope that helps. Yum. So it's, yeah, it's, yum. It's, it's, it's smelling good. It is smelling good. In our house, there's a, um, there's a, um, a bottle of smells good. Mm. I'm going to have to start doing stuff that you probably can't see now, but that's okay. I'll, I'll try and try and show, but in right. essence, I'm going to try and plumb this kettle okay. into the cube. I will follow along and as so best I'll, I can. I'll lift, 
I'll okay, lift I'm up. Oh, yep, sure, yeah, there you go. Good. I'm just going to, yeah, into the cube. Then goes into the cube. I'm just going to drag a little bit of... Ah! Big cubes are better than small cubes for stability. Yeah, sometimes you need four hands. And I'm going to slowly decant liquid from here into here. Some people just open it up and let it go just hard. Rip. Okay, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I like to go slow because I think I keep, I think I keep more stuff in the kettle if I go slow. Yep. So the temperature of the wort at this point is probably still it's up around 85, 90? I'd say it's, it's probably about 80 to 85, 80 to 85 based on what I was looking at when you weren't looking. Mm. I do love, do love me the smell of hot wort. Have you heard of uh, a hot scotchy? Are you familiar with that drink? I believe it's, uh, I think, uh, as you were talking about Ray Daniels earlier, I think it's a, I don't know if it's an invention of his, but basically when he's brewing, he'll add a, take a, a glass of warm wort and add a, a shot of scotch to it. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it's called a hot scotchy. Sounds like it could be quite, quite nice on a cold brew day winter brew day but yeah you wouldn't want to do too many of them I'm not a fan of drinking whilst I'm brewing I think there's plenty of time afterwards as you might expect there's plenty of conversation about whether or not you should should try and get all of the the air out of the cube. I'm going to end up spilling some, I know. Yeah, expect a bit of mess. At this point. For your, for your, if, you, if you're brewing for your first, or in general, but mm. if you haven't brewed before, prepare for it. Uh, brewing in the kitchen, uh, just have some maybe towels on hand. Check that out. And, uh, look at that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can see. That, but Jeff's kind of made a loop out of the, the tube. So at this point you could try and squeeze all of the air out of the, the cube and it's a good idea. I'm not going to today because it, I'm trying to make it nice and easy. And if you look at the way that um, professional cube manufacture happens, I don't bother that much. So yeah, there's a little so, bit of uh, <clears throat> air space in the, in the handle there, but that's not you wouldn't call that uh, I wouldn't uh, be fussed by that, about. particularly if I'm, only, if I'm only gonna let it cool down and pitch yeast into it tomorrow or the next yeah, day. Yeah, right. If I, was, if I felt that I was gonna be leaving it for weeks or months, then I might be a bit more pedantic about it. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm doing this quite quickly, you know, quite soon after, then I'm, gonna, I'm happy with that. Um, in a traditional brewing scenario, this, um, this would be cooled to, or chilled with um, so all sorts of heat exchangers, either um, an immersion chiller or um, some sort of external heat exchanger that the wort would pass through into, a, into the fermenter. And that's a fine way of doing things. I like this mechanism because it, it separates the wort production from the fermentation. It takes what is notionally an end-to-end -end process. Mm. It starts with cracking grain and it ends with pitching yeast or even packaging <coughs> and turns it into two related processes, which is work production and fermentation. If I've got had a really big pot, I could make two, three, four, a hundred cubes of wort and then just ferment them when I get to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if mm. my ferment is not as big as my, my, um, my kettle. Um, 
because I can just store it like this and mm. until I want to put it into a into a, a fermenter. Ferment at your leisure, so to speak. Yes. So this um, would be left overnight at minimum, um, and then um, put into a, a fermenter, a fermenting vessel that has been cleaned, rinsed, and sanitised with the right amount of yeast. Mm-hmm. Abs cannot over overstress pitching the correct amount mm. of yeast. Um, for me, um, I like to use neutral yeasts, so anyone who's been around me for, two, for any period of time will know that I like Nottingham as a yeast, USO5 is good for this, um, but any of the dried yeasts use at least as much as the manufacturer recommends or get yourself to a good pitching rate calculator and, um, and err on the side of caution. Mm. The key to success is using lots and lots of healthy yeast. Yep. And so, at the beginning, um, we said that we were going to do this. We did. It's not the full eight steps um, of, the, of Easy Brew because Easy Brew um, also contains this, um, pitching yeast, mm. packaging, and drinking the beer. Um, at <laughs> the that important point, part is drinking I said the that's beer. sort of you're on your own at that point. We have to go and find some more beer for us to drink. Um, but that being that, I need to clean up and then go and find that beer, Joel. That sounds like a stream to me. So uh, if anyone uh, is interested in learning more about home brewing, we have how-to videos up on our YouTube channel. Uh, and there's a quite a good brew in a bag video that goes through uh, the basic steps of what Jeff covered here, but on a, on a larger scale. Um, uh, and on our website, you can also find our stream schedule. Uh, all the links are in the description below. So. If you uh, want to see what topics we're coming up, check that out. Um, but, uh, oh, we just had one more question come through. Uh, do you adjust the late edition hops when cubing? Uh, I think the quick answer to that is you just treat them as late edition hops, don't in you? A, in a tradition, um, if you're working to a traditional um, um, recipe, if the recipe is crafted for a traditional brew, s brew system, then yes. But with this, with this particular recipe, the recipe is that the hops go in at the end of the boil. It's designed that way. Is it? Yes, that, yep. that's the design. And yep. um, so um, I'm adding um, a quantity of hops based on the amount of hop flavour that I'm looking for. And uh, in my experience, the bitterness looks after itself. Um, mm. And so I forget exactly when, um, but Joel spoke about this a bit more earlier in this stream. Um, about how um, it's not like these days we brewers tend to talk a lot about um, hops in terms of grams per litre and I think that's to describe the flavour they impart. We're not focusing so much on bitterness these days, mm. I think. Yeah, we're, just we're shifting work it out away. For itself. Yeah, it's the, um, the current. I don't know if you want to call it fashion, but um, uh, idea. So, you know, there's, yeah, basically uh, the current trend is yeah, moving all the hops to the end of the boil, uh, Navinator. So de it de all depends on the recipe and what you're going for, but uh, fine, perhaps if you're cubing and it's your first, you're still getting your head around uh, the process, maybe stick to recipes that just by nature have uh, IPAs or pale ales that have all the hops pushed to the end of the boil and you just add them as Jeff did here, just didn't flame out and um, don't really sweat too much about the bitterness. The whole notion like of the easy brew, as I'm calling it, is it this, the eight step process that I've tried to outline here today is to make things as simple as possible. There's absolutely no timing involved. Um, the hops have been added at the end to give you a nice hoppy flavour and without having to worry about when you're, at, when you're adding them, um, no no calculations around bitterness, it's all about the flavour. Um, serendipitously, when you use um, the sorts of hops that work well in this, which is um, stuff like Galaxy, Simcoe, the, um, the high alpha, high flavour hops, the bitterness just tends to work just, itself just, out. Just works itself out, yeah. 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 And um, my process for learning is always iterative. You do it once, if you say that's too bitter, then you can make an adjustment next time. Yeah. One of the cool things about making a small batch of beer is that if it is too bitter, 
you don't have to drink 400 litres of beer that's too bitter, mm. you have to drink seven. Yes. <laughs> Um, and yeah, as long as it's not going overboard, it's you, 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 you're usually find yourself in the ballpark. But there, there you go, another another um, reason for small batch brewing. It, it, there's a, there's a lot of uh, I think people probably saw the got the gist today. There's a lot of uh, benefits to small batch brewing um, uh, that we saw today. Uh, and yeah, one of them is, as Jeff just said, if the the beer doesn't taste great at the end of the day, you don't have uh, you haven't wasted a lot. But uh, I think just following the steps here. You, you're, you're pretty sure not to not to make wind up with a beer that's undrinkable. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. I hope so. so. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question, uh, Navinator. Uh, a little a little addendum there to the, the episode, but uh, we'll wrap things up now. And uh, everyone out there, stay safe and uh, happy brewing. Thanks for watching. See ya.